heard. It's, it's got to be what, five o'clock there, I think. Man, but I bet they got up really early just to get ready, you know, for this. So probably had yeah. breakfast and showered and ready to roll. It's 502, Bob said, get going. He said, what's the delay? <laughs> I had to go back to bed. Hurry it up. <laughs> all right. Well, all right, Bob. Uh, this is for, uh, for the sake of discussion. Uh, it is seven past seven this morning here in the Midwest, and we are going to get rolling. December 12th, and uh, off we go. At uh, Caesarea, Paul had three opportunities to present his defense. So, if you were here yesterday, this will sound a little bit like, a, what would you say, a, a bit of a review of, of yesterday in some ways, because he's now arguing his case again. So it's the same case, uh, what, different, uh, different authorities, new authorities, mm -hmm. same case. So, Caesarea, like yeah, so mm -hmm. Caesarea, Paul has three opportunities to present his defense and to preach the gospel to the Roman authorities who now hold him under arrest. The first appearance is before Felix, the governor and, uh, and procurator of Judah. Felix had been appointed initially by Claudius Caesar and then confirmed by Claudius' successor, Nero. Felix's wife, uh, Drulis, Drulisa, who is uh, mentioned by Luke, is the daughter of Herod Agrippa I and the sister of Herod Agrippa II. Before whom, it's like they live in the uh, Pat, uh, Appalachian Mountains, right? Okay, so, and uh, the sister of Herod Agrippa II, before whom Paul will also appear. Felix, knowing enough about the way to realize that there is no substance to the charges being brought against Paul, and Luke's account hints that Felix is even somewhat troubled by Paul's teaching. But, he is primarily motivated by greed and therefore is uh, in, in anger and in, in, engendered, therefore is engendered when Paul fails to offer a bribe. Luke record, Luke's record notes that Paul is forced to remain in jail for two years, at the end of which time Felix is removed from office. Secular history indicates the serious riots and charges against Felix by the Jews prompted his uh, recall to Rome. Felix is succeeded by Procrius Festus, about whom little is known. Festus is also, he also finds no fault in Paul and suggests that Paul once again be taken before the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem. But Paul, who though a Jew is also a Roman citizen by birth, exercises his right to appeal his case to Caesar. Shortly after Paul seeks an appeal, Festus is visited by King Agrippa, Herod Agrippa II, and his sister Bernice. It was their father, Herod Agrippa I, who had persecuted the church and killed James, the brother of John. When Festus expresses frustration regarding Paul's case, Agrippa asks if he can hear Paul's story for himself. Paul's presentation before Agrippa summarizes his personal conversion and subsequent ministry. At the conclusion of Paul's discourse, Luke related a memorable conversation between Agrippa and Paul in which Agrippa appears to be uncomfortably vulnerable to, uh, vulnerable to the gospel message presented by Paul. But if Agrippa is touched at all, there is no record that he ever resp responds in full belief. Five days later, the high priest Ananias went down to Caesarea with some of the elders and a lawyer named Tertullius, and they brought their charges against Paul before the governor. When Paul was called in, Tertullius presented his case before Felix. We have enjoyed a long period of peace under you, and your foresight has brought about reforms in this nation. Everywhere, in every way, most excellent Felix, we acknowledge this with profound gratitude, but in order not to weary you further, I would request that you be kind enough to hear us briefly. We have found this man to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. He is a ringleader of the Nazarene sect and even tried to discredit, desecrate the temple, so we seized him. 
By examining him yourself, you will be able to learn the truth about these charges we are bringing against him. The other Jews joined in the accusation, asserting that these things were true. When the governor motioned for him to speak, Paul replied, I know that for a number of years you have been a judge over this nation, so I gladly make my defense. You can easily verify that no more than 12 days ago I went to Jerusalem to worship. My accusers did not find me arguing with anyone at the temple or stirring up a crowd in the synagogue or anywhere else in the city. And they cannot prove to you the charges that they are now making against me. However, I admit that I worship the God of our ancestors and the follow as a follower of the way, which they call a sect. I believe everything that is in accordance with the law that is written in the prophets, and I have the same hope in God as these men themselves have, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. After an absence of several years, I came to Jerusalem to bring my people gifts for the poor and to present offerings. I was ceremonially clean when they found me in the temple courts doing this. There was no crowd with me, nor was I involved in any disturbance. But there are some Jews from the province of Asia who ought to be here before you and bring charges if they have anything against me. Or these who are here should state what crime they found in me when I stood before the Sanhedrin. Unless it was this one thing I shouted as I stood in their presence, it is concerning the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you today. Then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, adjourned the proceedings. When Lysias, the commander, comes, he said, I will decide your case. He ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard, but to give him some freedom and permit his friends to take care of his needs. Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. As Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now, you may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. At the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe, so he sent for him frequently and talked with him. When two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus, but because Felix wanted to grant a favor to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. Three days after arriving in the province, Festus went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem, where the chief priests and the Jewish leaders appeared before him and presented the charges against Paul. They requested Festus, as a favor to them, to have Paul transferred to Jerusalem, for they were preparing an ambush to kill him along the way. Festus answered, Paul is being held at Caesarea, and I myself am going there soon. Let some of your leaders come with me, and if the man has done anything wrong, they can press charges against him there. After spending eight or ten days with them, Festus went down to Caesarea. The next day, he convened the court and ordered that Paul be brought before him. When Paul came in, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him. They brought many serious charges against him, but they could not prove them. Then Paul made his defense. I have done nothing wrong against the Jewish law or against the temple or against Caesar. Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there on these charges? Paul answered, I am now standing before Caesar's court where I ought to be tried. I have not done any wrong to the Jews as you yourself know very well. If, however, I am guilty of doing anything deserving death I do not refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. After Festus had conferred with his counsel, he declared, you have appealed to Caesar. To Caesar, you will go. A few days later, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at Caesarea to pay their respects to Festus. Since they were spending many days there, Festus discussed Paul's case with the king. He said, there is a man here whom Felix left as a prisoner. When I went to Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews brought charges against him and asked that he be condemned. I told them that the, it is not the Roman custom to hand over anyone before they have faced their accusers and have had an opportunity to defend themselves against the charges. 
When they came here with me, I did not delay the case, but convened the court the next day and ordered the man to be brought in. When his accusers got up to speak, they did not charge him with any of the crimes I had expected. Instead, they had some points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a dead man named Jesus, who Paul claimed was alive. I was at a loss how to investigate such matters, so I asked if he would be willing to go to Jerusalem and stand trial there on these charges. But when Paul made his appeal to be held over for the emperor's decision, I ordered him held until I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear this man myself. He replied, tomorrow you will hear him. The next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and entered the audience room with the high ranking military officer and their prominent men of the city. At the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. Festus said, King Agrippa and all who are present with you, you see this man. The whole Jewish community has petitioned me about him in Jer Jerusalem and here in Caesarea, shouting that he ought not to live any longer. I found he had done nothing deserving of death, but because he made his appeal to the emperor, I decided to send him to Rome. But I have nothing definite to write to his, to, finite to write to his majesty about him. Therefore, I have brought him before all of you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that as a result of this investigation, I may have something to write. For I think it is unreasonable to send a prisoner onto Rome without specifying the charges against him. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. So Paul motioned with his hand and began his defense King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defense against all the accusations of the Jews and especially so that so because you are willing, well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. The Jewish people all know the way I have lived ever since I was a child from the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem. They have known me for a long time and can testify if they are willing that I conformed to the strictest sect of our religion, living as a Pharisee. And now it is because of my hope in what God has promised our ancestors that I am on trial today. This is the promise our 12 tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night. King Agrippa, it is because of this, this hope and these Jew, that these Jews are accusing me. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme. I was so uh, opposed with persecuting, obsessed with persecuting them, that I even hunted them down, hunted them down in foreign countries. On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and permission of the, ch the chief priests. About noon, King Agrippa, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against, kick against the goads. Then I asked, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. The Lord replied, now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So then, King Agrippa, I was not diso disobedient to the vision from heaven. First to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and then to the Gentiles, I preached that they should repent and turn to God and 
demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. That is why some Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But God was help, but God has helped me to this very day. So I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer. And as the at the first to rise, and, and as the first to rise from the dead would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You are out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. I am not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I am saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Then Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, short time or long, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become that what I am, except for these chains. The king rose, and with him the governor and Bernice, and those sitting with them. After they left the room, they began saying to one another, this man is not doing anything that deserves death or imprisonment. Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Great <laughs> opportunity for Paul to share the gospel. Yeah. It's amazing he had to spend two years in some ways, and, and at the same time, those were not wasted years, you know, and it's it's kind of it's kind of one of those things where you look at, at back and go, if this if this is me, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you know for my friends to kind of do the bribe thing, like get me out get me out of the jail, right? Go pay pay the pay the man and get me out of here. And uh, and at the same time, Paul's like, I'm not I'm not doing that, and I'm not wasting my time. And it wasn't a wasted time at all. And so uh, for Paul, it's, it's as if his circumstances, no matter how hard they are, he looks at them as opportunities. Mm -hmm. And where others were seeing um, hardship, he saw, you know, opportunity rich environments. And, uh, and how, do we, how do we take at least that piece from the text and go, man, there's something there for us to say, let's not waste this life of ours when we are are butting up against things that look really difficult how do we turn and uh, i mean he's like really the first uh, and the greatest of all lemonade makers right it's like uh you know I, I hope that you become like me except for the chains but nevertheless i gotta let you know even as i've been in chains not wasting a moment uh, let me tell you about the gospel <laughs> and he goes right after it it's just incredible to me what were you gonna say there uh Linfield? Well, I was just, <clears throat> I liked how uh, Paul ta talked to King Agrippa. It's like, you know, well, I'll say it in my own words. It's like, you know what I'm talking about, King? You, you, you go and do all the religious things. And that's, a, that's actually a poke at him because King Agrippa was not really known that well to do all every religious festival, every, and and so it's like you you know what I'm talking about, King Agrippa. I I uh, you you know all the rules and all this stuff because you do it too. And I just I just think that's kind of funny. And uh -huh. I'm just uh, I would have loved to seen King Agrippa's face when he said that. Like, oh hey, <laughs> uh, yeah, kind <laughs> <laughs> of too. Just, just the the way Paul spoke to these uh, to these um, royalties. If you want to say that um, uh -huh. it was just amazing, uh, you know he uh, he definitely definitely uh, you know stroked their ego a little bit and then kind of shot them. Boom! Hey, <laughs> you know you know what I'm right. talking about, King. Right. Uh, and uh, Woody mentioned you know he is one cool cucumber, man. He is cool under fire, and isn't that isn't that a a, a noteworthy thing as well? Just to say, you know what against you know these real hardships it's uh there's something here about maintaining your even disposition and being thoughtful in your responses i mean there's something there i think that's noteworthy as well that 
it doesn't say anything about that necessarily in the text, but uh, it does it does point out that you know it just in the way that he spoke and the way that he presented showed deference and respect and honor and uh, dignity and and clarity of, of thinking. I mean, there's just a lot of things here that uh, I think it's it's pretty pretty profound. But oh. yeah, what, anything else that you wanted to take note of there? I looked up what it meant to kick against the goads because. Oh yeah, tell us a little about like, what you learned. Oh, I don't recall that. Um, it reminds me a lot of your uh, babushka with the stick, but it's mm -hmm. a stick they use to drive cattle or herds of sheep and things. And if um, uh, a, a steer or a cattle of some sort was um, misbehaving, they would use the pointed end of it to poke them. And sometimes they would kick. The more they kicked, the more they got poked. So yeah. it, so this it's the was the pointy a little end of the stick. Yeah. It, a commentary saying that perhaps God had been working on Paul's conscience for a while and that he was kicking mm -hmm. against the goal of getting poked. But I well, know. I think that that's a good point that you said that. I mean, in Acts 24 16 that we read, it said, you know, I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. And I think that's a that's a, a point of, of, you know, that's not something that necessarily comes without some intentionality. So God must have been working and he must have been working to receive his, his trying to keep his conscience clean in the way that he was acting and allowing his actions and his words to be in congruent alignment. So uh, I think there's uh, something there, Jay, that you're noting that's uh, worthy of our attentiveness. Let Phil, well, we have one other true oh, about ahead, his convert well true about his conversion too because he had this dramatic conversion but it may have been that there were pricks uh, along the way leading up to that and don't we all know i mean it's like when you give your life to christ it's like this massive change for most of us it's like it's like you know we go from being religious to being set free and walking in grace or we go from being irreligious to going man i just want jesus and yet there's a refining that goes on for the rest of our lives where, you know, a lot of things get chiseled away at first, but it's that, it's that refining with sandpaper business that kind of hurts a lot and is often, uh, it's often is, you know, the, the long haul, you know, <laughs> the long haul of the sanctification process can be a real painful one. So, and there's no yeah. reason to doubt that Paul was in the process from the time that he, first accepts Christ until the time that he enters into eternity, right? Sure. Right. And <clears throat> sometimes, well, you know, the the pro, pro, the pro the Felix, the guy before Festus, you know, he was getting poked because, <laughs> uh, you know, it even mentions that this was becoming, uh, you know, something that he, you know, uh, was thinking on, like, maybe, maybe so, maybe this, and then, and then uh, I think with uh, Festus, uh, I think a good way, I mean, I think Paul knew that he was, he was listening and when, because he's had two years to talk to Festus and two, you know, he's just talking over and over about Jesus and about the resurrection. And, and I think he, he threw that in there, not only to talking about himself uh, with the, with being prodded along, but mm -hmm hey, Festus, you know, maybe, maybe this is you too. And then all of a sudden Festus is like, you're insane. You're crazy. Because it might have been, I, I'm just saying, you know, this way, maybe it could have been, I don't know. Um, but you, you, uh, <laughs> you, he might have been like, oh, maybe this is making sense a little bit. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden it's like, oh, I can't, you're, you're insane. You're crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyways, which I, I have, I have some mixed feelings about uh, in in the text there because if if you remember why he pointed to him being a, you know kind of insane is you know he's he's so learned, and I and I and I look at some people and I like man you are so you know book wise that you are absolutely no earthly good you know <laughs> so I kind of I kind of can relate to to uh, uh, you know the emperor going wait a second this guy is no 
he's he's no good. He's just too smart. He's too smart for his own his own good, and and he's just too learned. You're you're you've lost your mind in your in your words, right? And so I kind of kind of uh, I kind of go I I know I know those I know those people. I, I I hang out with some of those people, and and yet at the same time I think what you're saying is probably really more true. Where uh, suddenly when things are penetrating, you know when when uh, when the gospel is hitting your heart, you've got that one last stand to kind of, you know, push away. And, uh, and I think that's what we're really seeing is, is I just have to reject right now. And I don't have any basis for my rejection other than if, if I can't point to anything that's wrong in the argument, I'm going to point to something wrong in the, in the deliverer of the argument, right? And so I'm going to point at you as the problem rather than receive the words that you're speaking. Uh, so you're the problem because this is starting to hurt or penetrate or impact. And rather than receive this, I have to reject this. And in order to reject this, I can't do it on the basis of its logic. I have to do it on the basis of who you are. And in this case, the only thing I can think of is you're just too smart. So right. I, I think there's something that is probably even more real about his choosing to reject and his last kind of push away as being what was probably more likely true. But I do know those people. They're just, yeah. they're, right. they're so heavenly minded. They're no earthly good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. uh, one last thing. I just love how, you know, it says in Acts 26, it, you know, it says, I am, I am not insane. Paul's talking. I'm not insane. Most excellent Festus, Paul replied, but what I am saying is true and reasonable because, you know, they're starting to think. And then uh, I love this part. Uh, the king is familiar with these things. I love how he brings back King Agrippa. Yeah. Hey, Bob, yeah. you, you're familiar with this. And King Agrippa is probably like, don't, don't bring me the, into this. Don't, don't, don't drag me into this story. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Oh, it's pretty funny. funny. All right. Well, let's go look at some questions then. Um, how was uh, Paul caught in the system? Well, I mean, he was stuck between the Jews wanting to, you know, make a claim against him and these uh, kings and procurators wanting really, being curious about what he had to say and not really wanting to take full responsibility. They didn't, they kind of just kept putting it off, you know, like I'll go visit with Paul for a little bit, my favorite prisoner, and then we'll, we'll leave him tucked away in here because I don't want to deal with the Jews, you know? Mm -hmm. But I don't know the full history of that, but he certainly got the runaround for two years. Yeah, well, he's definitely caught in between Felix and Festus. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, Fe Felix, or yeah, Felix just kind of, you, here you are, and Festus inherited this, this controversy between Jews and Paul. And so then all of a sudden it's caught in the system no, there was the, the moment where in the text it said, you know, man, as, as, uh, as they're listening, he's like, he shouldn't have appealed to Rome. I mean, we could have released right. him long ago. Now, that's yeah. maybe true, maybe not true. I mean, the fact that they said it, probably true. But, you know, they, the crowd was kind of riled up, wanted to kill him. At the time, it looked uh, like, you know, certain doom was on his doorstep. And so he appeals to Rome. Uh, and saves himself in that moment. Now it's been elevated. They're like, had it come to us, which it may never have come to them, but if it had come to us in the first place, he'd have likely been free, but we don't know if it would have ever gotten that far. He might not have survived the night. Uh, what does Paul's example of self-defense have to teach us? What do you notice that Paul does? He, well, one thing I noticed that Paul, um, he, <clears throat> he he tells more of his testimony like this is what i was this is what i am but instead of defending just himself he defends the gospel mm -hmm. and uh and that's a that's pretty cool to see that uh you know i i do this um because of the one that was resurrected not uh yep. Not so he personally I'm... uses the he uses the 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 testimony as his personal defense. He also right. uses the law, the law of the yep. land. He leans into what's legally afforded him in a way of 
offering significant protection to him. So he doesn't try to out, uh, you know, do an end round uh, of the law. He, he works inside of the legal system in a, in a way that's, uh, I think, important just to note. So there's a, uh, a using of these uh, rules and laws that have been brought about that Paul's like, yeah, we don't need to, we don't need to try to get out of that. We need to work inside of that. And, uh, and he chooses to do that. How does, how did Paul hold his civil rights? Well, this is one of the few occasions that Paul brought out the Roman part. I'm, I'm a Roman citizen. I want to go to Caesar. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of, <laughs> I don't know if Festus was uh, ready for that. You know, well, obviously he, he wasn't thinking that he was a Jew and all of a sudden mm -hmm. it's like, no, I'm, I'm going to appeal to Caesar because I'm a Roman citizen and every Roman citizen has the right to appeal. To bring their case. To bring their case before the emperor. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, Paul was a, was a smart dude. He knew, he knew the law of the lands, not just not just Jewish law, but right. Roman law as well. So in what way did Paul's arrest help him spread the news about Christ? And Jenny, why don't you lead into that with what you were about to share? Oh, well, I was just, it's interesting. Paul didn't always use the Roman card. He's had, he had had other opportunities that, mm -hmm. or he will have, I know, but hasn't always used it. So it's interesting um, I don't know if that's spirit led or what it was when he chooses to use it. Um, and when he's not chosen to use it, there's been, there's times that he doesn't use the Roman card. So it's pretty that's interesting, right. but um, it definitely helps him to spread the gospel because he doesn't stop talking about it, whether he's in prison or in front of a king or in front of a procurator. And I mean, with two years, who knows what the Bible would look like without his extra writing time, you know, mm -hmm. he, he did a lot of writing in prison. So uh, maybe it was a little uh, retreat for him to not be traveling so much. He had opportunity to, to send letters and uh, that we, you know, of course, use daily now. And additionally, you know, he's chained to a Roman centurion. I mean, he's chained, he's chained to these Roman soldiers. <laughs> For two years, I mean, he's he's walking with them, eating with them, talking with them. I can't imagine that it's like, okay, now that I'm in prison, I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bother you with the gospel. <laughs> I kind of think, you know, being, being, uh, you know, kind of chained to Paul. I think it's got to be a lot like what most people experience when they're on a plane with Pastor Linfield. It's kind of like <laughs> they, they 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 just thought they were they just thought they were having a, a, a day of work or a day of, of rest or vacation and no no Linfield's on the plane and so yeah. they're gonna have to hear the gospel. <laughs> Amen. So I think I think there might be something that's similar to that circumstance for these poor Roman soldiers who had no idea what they were getting into. You know. All right. But, so you know, there's and, probably a one-on-one -on -one evangelism beyond his writing and beyond his public proclamations, for sure. right? For you sure. Know. And the interesting thing about this arrest, you know, Paul has been earnestly wanting to get to Rome. That's like his main thing. And then this is this is a, finally a chance for him. It's not the it probably wasn't the the idea that he had to get to Rome, but it's like okay, now he's going to get to Rome where he can, he can now preach the gospel there and, and encourage that newly founded church in Rome um, as well. And so it's a, he, he is now spreading it to the main capital of the world. <laughs> yeah. Rome. And he gets a free ride there. Yeah. Right? Free, yeah. but yeah. I don't know if I'd like his ride. He's going to go on. <laughs> I can I can almost I, I, David in the chat. I wonder how many soldiers have asked for a transfer. I'm like, uh, yeah. can I just go to the Western Front and go against the <laughs> Scandinavian hordes? I mean, this is ridiculous. I'm I'm about to give up my heart for this man. You know, it's, like, <laughs> it's like, what? Get me out of here! You know, give me some easy task where I'm on some military front. Why do I have to be here? You know, uh, why might might God allow us to suffer for what seems like no apparent reason? <clears throat> well, 
God, yeah, to us, it seems like no apparent reason. Um, but, you know, I think, uh, I think Paul understood that I will suffer for, for the kingdom of God to, to grow, to go forward. And, uh, and I, I think that those that know Jesus as their personal savior um, truly have him in his, their life like Paul did, that there's a reason for, for the time that you're in. Suffering, good, whatever it is, there's a reason to speak about Jesus Christ and the love and the hope and the salvation he, he brings. And so I think, um, I think in the midst of Paul's suffering, he had a stronger testimony and a stronger um, um, case for the gospel than if he was just a free man out doing whatever he wanted because no <laughs> no sane person would be in prison and still be preaching the you know that's what um you know these romans would think and so it was just a great great uh, opportunity um to preach the gospel in the midst of rejoice suffering. and again i say rejoice right and, mm -hmm. and so he was one who in these hardships was able to turn suffering into a rejoicing metaphor now jenny would you just read uh, jody's uh comment and make one last reflection sure hold on just one minute while i get it up here uh she said it is often in our suffering that we have the closest connection to god and the opportunity to share our relationship with our savior savior with others and last reflection about that concept no oh, so true it's been, our, it's been our experience, I think, in, in this, in this, I mean, I'll think I could, I could point to all three of us and share story. I, I'd love to share Linfield and Jenny's stories, in fact, because they're so much more powerful than what some of you know around yeah. suffering, but, uh, and I hate sharing my own, so I'd rather share theirs anyway. <laughs> yeah. but, but I think all three of us could probably resonate with the fact that, right, uh, it's in our suffering that we've become the women and men that God is allowing us to become. For sure. And so we look back over suffering going, I don't wish that upon my worst enemy, but I don't, I don't hate that that's caused me to become who I am today. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. uh, and I think that a lot of times it becomes our great tutor. So Jenny, pray over us today, because I know you have a deep reservoir of that personal pain to have caused you to become the woman of God that you are. Yeah. Lord Jesus, I just thank you so much that you have made a way for us to gather together with you and these people every morning, read your word and uh, just build the faith in one another and um, have our own faith built by spending time with you and discovering what you have for us in your word. I thank you, Lord, that you have given us um, government that uh, is there to uh, protect us and to uh, discipline us when needed and that we can use it to further the gospel and to spread your word so help us to be good citizens help us to use what you've given us to its fullest potential and lord god just thank you for the suffering that you have allowed in our lives that have brought each one of us closer to you and um, has built our faith and although we wouldn't wish to go through it again and we wouldn't wish it upon anyone else we do um, recognize and thank you for what it has done in our lives so we ask, Lord, that you would um, help us to go forth today, that each of us would uh, keep our eyes on you and uh, be willing to share who you are and what you've done when you give us the opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, gang. Well, it is a weekend, so if you haven't yet registered for services, you can go to thejourneynorth.com and uh, register for services as well as Make sure you download the app and you can catch all of the updated information through the app as well. And so hopefully we see you either online or in person, uh, but join us for service this weekend. God bless you guys. Have a great day. And Jenny, thank you so much for joining us today as a panelist. You bet. Yes. You bet. Have see a you great again. day. Bye. Bye, everybody.